spirituality, spiritual paths that seek perfection and spiritual paths that speak wholeness. Anytime you talk about perfection, that usually works out to getting rid of things. You know, your, your sexuality, you can't have that. You get rid of it. Your, you know, these, this and that and the other, all kinds of things. It all involves narrowing down to try to become perfect by becoming less than you are. Whereas a tradition of wholeness such as Druidry involves taking all that you are, everything that you are, everything that you can be, and bringing that into balance and into harmony with the, with the divine, with the world of nature. Welcome to the Embrace and Expand podcast, where we talk about everything from spirituality, self-development, relationships, mindfulness, wellness, and everything that will help you embrace all that you are so you can expand into the best version of yourself. Okay, and welcome back to another episode of the Embrace and Expand podcast. So our guest on today's episode is a widely respected author and blogger in fields ranging from nature spirituality to the future of industrial society. He has written more than 70 books, including 16 novels, and blogs weekly on his website, ecosophia.net. An initiate into Druidic, Hermetic, and Masonic lineages, he's served for 12 years as Grand Arch Druid of the Ancient Order of Druids in America. Currently residing in Rhode Island with his wife, Sarah, he is a wealth of knowledge, and I am delighted to have him as a guest on the podcast. It is an honor and a privilege to introduce you to John Michael Greer. John, welcome to the Embrace and Expand podcast. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be on. So for those of our listeners that aren't familiar with your writings, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about your background? Okay. Um, The the really short version, um, I was born a good many years ago in Bremerton, Washington, on the the west side of Puget Sound, right across from Seattle. Grew up in the Seattle area. Um, Experienced the the soul-sucking qualities of um, late 20th century suburbia while growing up and decided that whatever I wanted in life, it wasn't that. So that sent me on on various quests. I was an expert on werewolf trivia by age 10. Um, I was fascinated by anything that was stranger and more interesting than the one-dimensional life that um, you know my, the media and schools and everything else seemed to be offering at that time. Um, got involved in Western occult spirituality, got involved in druidry, got involved in a whole range of things, and um, started writing because it's, you know, that's one of the ways one can one can make one's living at that, you know, in that end of, of life today, and it just kind of never stopped. So I write a lot. I blog a lot. I live a, I live a quiet life in Rhode Island these days. It's been kind of a cross-country journey, and, you know, life is good. Something you and I actually have similar. I am originally from Snohomish, Washington, so I'll about 45 Snohomish. minutes yeah, of north where you were from. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. now residing in Virginia, so kind of moved to the same end of the country that's as good. you. I was going to say, yeah. Yeah, the same kind of cross-continental journey. Okay, yeah. Exactly. And I honestly kind of came to that same realization living in the Seattle area of just mm-hmm. feeling like this constant strive to be better than the neighbor or have the fancier car or the nicer house Mm -hmm. or more and more and more and more and more just led me down a path of not really feeling totally fulfilled more on a soul level than on a financial Mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. here we are on the other side of the country trying to pursue more of a a quiet Mm -hmm. life and just Mm -hmm. really live life on my wife and I's terms, which sounds very similar Mm -hmm. to what you and Sarah are doing. Definitely sound like the same kind of thing. Well, good. I think I think more and more people these days are realizing that the, you know, the sort of American dream has turned into an American nightmare. And it's all, you know, you're, you have to compete, you have to get out there and buy stuff and sell stuff and market yourself and all for the benefit of a huge sprawling corporate structure that doesn't actually help anybody lead a better life. I could not have said it better myself. Now, that really kind of brings us back to for those listening that aren't familiar with Druidry, like, what is Druidry? And mm-hmm. really, what led you to pursuing being the Arch Druid for the Order here in America? <laughs> okay. Um, I didn't pursue becoming Grand Arch Druid of AODA. It kind of happened to me. The, the long story, this, this is, I'll, I'll kind of condense this to the extent that I can, but 
Um, see, I, I mentioned that I got um, into Western esoteric spirituality quite early in my late teen years, in fact. What you could get at that time was a particular tradition, the Golden Dawn tradition. It was, most, it was that or Wicca, and Wicca's never really, never really interested me. And so I, so I studied various you know, sorry, Golden Dawn-related occult material, and I had this interest in Druidry, but there's nothing available on the side of the Atlantic at that time. And then it happened that um, I was involved in a magical lodge, and one of the other people in the lodge was involved in a druid group. I was like, well, cool. So we talked about it, and I joined. This was the local grove, as they call local groups, of the um, Order of Bards, Ovates, and Druids, which is the largest druid order in the world these days. And they had just gotten a Seattle presence. And so I joined, and I got, I got really active in, in that, that particular branch of druidry, of druid nature spirituality. I found it very fulfilling. And I, I was going, wow, this is cool. This, this actually speaks to my, my spiritual needs, my emotional needs, my sense of communings with the divine in nature, and so on. And so the Obad, the, the Order of Bards, Ophians, and Druids, has a correspondence course. That's how they do a lot of their training. And so I took that course and finished it and got my, you got my certificate on the wall and this kind of stuff. And I was thinking, okay, what's next? Well, there wasn't anything next at that time in Oba. So I looked into a couple of other Druid orders and I ended up found, finding some references to this small Druid order that had been active in America. And it sounded kind of interesting from the, the few descriptions I could get, the ancient order of Druids in America. Hmm. So I set out trying to find it. Long, complicated process. I finally located um, one of the one of the members, the current secretary at that time, um, a guy named guy by the name of John Gilbert, and John um, brought me into the order. And I mean, to the extent that it was possible, there were only about eleven members at that time. They were all very old. It had it, it had been through various organizational problems and so on. It was it had fallen in very hard times. And so we, I started talking to these these old folks and saying, you know. This, yeah, I would like to learn first, of course, I was going, okay, I'd like to learn more about AODA. This is just, this is kind of interesting what I've heard. And we went from there to, wow, this is great. Have you considered blowing the dust off this and getting it back into circulation, getting it up on its feet again? And then it went to, you want me to run it? And that's how I became Grand Arch Druid of the Ancient Order of Druids in America. I was the first person who'd expressed any noticeable interest in the thing for like 15 years. So they brought me in, gave me the initiations, and plopped me with about three months of advance warning in the northern chair as Grand Arch Druid, and left me to well, I, they didn't leave me, but except most of them, we, we lost I think three of them in the first year, and at this point they're all gone, mm. <laughs> and so so that was you know it was it was me or nothing, but but it worked really well. I was Grand Arch Druid for twelve years. I got the order on its feet. I got. I took it from 11 members to well over a thousand by the time I stepped down. I'm still a member, but I'm, I'm no longer the, the the head honcho. And so, at the end of 12 years, I was able to hand it over to a successor and um, start focusing my attention on some of the other things I'd learned. And um, it's 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 still doing fine. But that's how I got the funny title and the funny hat and you know um, it's whatever bragging rights you get from being. From having been the the grand panjandrum of a of a small alternative spiritual group in America today, not as though there's you know a shortage of those. Beautiful. Well, it's a beautiful story, and I have definitely personally read a little bit about that just through some of your books. I just finished um, the Druid Path. Mm -hmm. I just recently picked up the Mysteries mm -hmm. of Merlin. Um, and ah, you'll have fun with that. Uh, I I I just find the way that you are able to bring light to these old ancient teachings that unfortunately did mm -hmm. not have any sort of text that was handed down. And if it was, that was obviously destroyed mm -hmm. by the Roman Empire when they swept through the United Kingdom. And mm -hmm. so how, how did you go about figuring out how to do some of this stuff and how to shed light on these old teachings that would have only mm -hmm. ever been handed down via word of mouth. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing is, I was not starting from scratch. The Ancient Order of Druids in America, AODA, was founded in 1912, and it got its it got its charter, it got its original um, material from an order, an older organization in Britain, um, the Ancient and Archaeological Order of Druids. I love that name. Um, and, you know, you can trace it back. The Druid revival actually got started in um, 
well, actually, before the United States was founded. The, the traditional date is 1717. Nobody knows if that's quite accurate, but it was around that. You had people basically in Britain at that time. You had people who were looking at the options that were available to them in the spiritual life of the time. You had a very dogmatic, formalistic right of Christianity. And you had an equally dogmatic um, scientific materialism that was just getting its feet going under it. And both of them were saying, you know, these are the only options. You either do exactly what we tell you and believe, you know, our dogma, or you can do exactly what we tell you and believe our dogma. Your pick is between the two. And there were a fair number of people in early 18th century Britain who looked at that and said, I'm going to take door number three. And when both the scientists and the religious types were going, there is no door number three, they said, well, that's fine. We'll invent one. And so there were very, actually quite a number of alternative spiritual groups got going in Britain during those years. But there was a certain number of people who were interested in what little was remembered of the teachings of the ancient Druids. And since nobody else was using the name, they, they kind of picked it up and used it for themselves. Do the, does, does modern Druidry descend from the ancient Druids? Not in any sense that, that you know, um, that can be documented. If there's any connection at all, it's by little bits of oral tradition, a few old stories handed down. But the core of Druidry is the spiritual relationship between the individual and the world's nature. And last I checked, that's still around. So it's not a matter of having to have some kind of linkage to the distant past. You ha can have a linkage to the sky and the sea and the forest and the land, and those are right here, right now. Hmm. And so that was that became a, a kind of the driving principle behind the the rise of what's called the Druid revival, the the rebirth of Druidry in the 18th century, which has continued up until now. By the time I became a Druid, um, back, in the, back in the early 1990s, there was already a great deal of traditional lore that had been built up over some 300 years of hard work by various people in the Druid scene. And so it wasn't a matter of me having to invent this stuff. It was a matter of, okay, I have these teachings that I've received by way of the first Druid order that I joined, and I have these others that I received from John Gilbert and the other members of, of AODA. Here are some other sources that are increasingly easy to find these days in, in, in the age of online archives. And so can I put together a system of, of teaching, a system of instruction and practice based on these things? Why, yes. Now let's field test it and see if it works. And I had a lot of help with that. A lot of, you know, there were plenty of people who were interested in um, checking out checking out a, a modern druidry, a druid path, a path of nature, spirituality relevant to our time right now. And so that's kind of how all that stuff came together. It's interesting at how you were really able to take some of the information that, like you said, already existed, but just like you did with the order, really expand upon that through mm -hmm. constant research, not only through text, but constant research within your own aspirations and your own actual experience mm -hmm through the world and how you interacted with nature. Now, would you say that Druidry falls similarly to animism, similarly to shamanism, or are all three of those kind of unique into themselves? Well, basically, one of the things that is one of the basic principles of the Druid revival, since it, since it was founded back in, the, back in the early 18th century, is that we don't do dogma. We don't have a rigid set of rules for how you must be a druid. We offer possibilities. So there are druids who are animists, and there are druids who are, who are frankly, shamans. There are druids who are polytheists, druids who are monotheists, druids who are all kinds of things. It's more an orientation toward experiencing the divine in nature. How you go about doing that, well, here's this range of practice we have. Take your pick. We've got this lovely smorgasbord of options. And combine that with the, what what Philip Cargom, the head of the who was the head of um, Order of Bards of and Druids when I when I joined, he used to say there are three senses, three mystical senses that every druid has to should should constantly work on cultivating: um, a sense of humor, a sense of proportion, and common sense. <laughs> <laughs> and so those three mystical senses applied to. The, the sort of orientation toward nature spirituality, you combine those, those together, and you basically have the foundation of Druidry. What you do then is, well, you know, practice. 
Um, the the thing the thing is, I mean, I I admit there are geeks who are not computer geeks. I am one of them. I am I am an occultism geek, an esotericism geek, an old mysterious documents written in Latin or what have you geek. I love that kind of stuff. So it's you know I probably would have been a complete waste in in almost any other job other than a writer in in the fields that I write in. But you know I'm well suited to that one. You touched on so many things of why I, the more I've read about Druidry, and I've been very interested in Druidry ever since I was a little kid. I mean, my mm -hmm. father's side mm -hmm. of the family cool. um, dates back to England. My mother's side of the family dates back to Scotland. My grandmother's uh, maiden name was McCrimmon, um, which were the pipers for the McLeod clan. So if, if you're a mm -hmm. fan of Braveheart mm -hmm. listening to this show, you know, those names may sound familiar, but um, <laughs> everything Celtic, everything that had that, you know, mysticism around the Arthurian sagas and Merlin, and it just always fascinated me. And then the more that I've dove into reading about Druidry and, you know, honestly, a lot of your books, it makes me realize that how just being attuned to nature and just trying to live a life of harmony with nature is the path of druidry now whatever that ends up looking like if you choose to dress in a specific way or you choose to not dress mm -hmm. in a specific way that doesn't really matter and that lack of dogma is really the thing that interests me the most of it because it's all encompassing it's almost like we don't really care who you are as long as you honor mm -hmm. nature the way that it was intended Exactly. The druidry is not about it's not about handing out handing out a long list of rules, and it's about it's again it's an orientation. It's an orientation towards uh, experiencing the divine in nature. One of our basic principles is that spirituality does not have to be dull. It does not have to be boring. It does not have to be humorless. It does not have to involve cooping yourself up in an airless you know hall somewhere, and where you can sing off key. <laughs> There's lots of ways to be spiritual, and um, <clears throat> one of the one of the important Druid leaders of about a century ago, uh, George McGregor Reed, used to say, um, "God is too sm God is too great to fit in any building." Mm -hmm. And it's a it's, it's a very Druid kind of attitude. Um, I would say that the divine is, is present everywhere, including in, inside you know <laughs> inside buildings, but. He had a point, which is that there tends to be a very, a very stifling, very constricted quality to some some of the spiritual traditions in Western in in Western civilization. We have this this pervasive sense that to become spiritual is to become less than you are, to get rid of this and get rid of that and throw that part out of your life, and and to kind of cram yourself into this narrow little mold. And you know, if that seems right to some people, okay, that's fine. It seems wrong to me. It seems to me that if the divine created us as complex as we are, as rich as we are, as as um, multi-directional as we are, maybe the divine had a reason for that, and maybe we should honor that and accept the fact that you know we're not just uh, you know kind of destined to become eternal choir boys. Mm. Yeah, that's that's just such an interesting way of addressing it because so many of the religions that I've encountered throughout my life, it is all mm -hmm. about you have to live this very strict lifestyle and do as I mm -hmm. say and not expand mm -hmm. your own consciousness in any way. Whereas yeah. Druidry mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. all about expanding your consciousness mm -hmm. that exists within everything mm -hmm. that we can put eyes on. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Um, one, one of the distinctions, this is another thing that I got from Philip Cargom. He draws a, a distinction between spirituality, spiritual paths that seek perfection, and spiritual paths that speak wholeness. Anytime you talk about perfection, that usually works out to getting rid of things. You know, your, your sexuality, you can't have that. You get rid of it. Your, you know, these, this and that and the other, all kinds of things. It all involves narrowing down to try to become perfect by becoming less than you are. Whereas a tradition of wholeness such as Druidry involves taking all that you are, everything that you are, everything that you can be, and bringing that into balance and into harmony with the, with the divine, with the world of nature. 
and not not repressing or suppressing any of it, not falling into some kind of narrow narrow you know mold you must obey this set of rules but what what does the divine intent for you what is your path in existence every soul is different every soul walks a different road and and so your wholeness and my wholeness are not the same thing and so there isn't a lot of room for dogma and there isn't a lot of room for these sort of narrow um thou shalt you know um thou, thou shalt not this and that and the other and more a matter okay how can i balance this how can i bring these parts of my life into a state of harmony where i am not harming anybody i'm not harming myself i am not harming the world i'm using everything that i am to, to create beauty and to create happiness and wisdom mm. that's beautiful and what's so fascinating about this and what i found incredibly intriguing in the druid path was at how to practice druidry, there's a couple of things that you need to do. You need to observe, you need to meditate, you need to do divination, and then ritual. And mm -hmm. the topic of meditation I found incredibly interesting because I, I talk a lot about meditation mm -hmm. on this podcast. And, you know, you note mm -hmm. in that book at how the current day philosophy around meditation is to completely silence the mind, have no thoughts whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And I actually in doing mm -hmm. a little bit of research leading up to this podcast, I listened to a talk that you did about eight years ago that can be found on YouTube where you referenced uh, modern day mindfulness is mindlessness. And I, I just chuckled at that. Too often. Because yeah. that's... Too often it yeah. is. Yeah. It, it's, it's almost like the idea of here, sit down, shut up, and don't listen to your own internal mm -hmm. dialogue. Or listen to it only to the extent that you can get it to shut up. You're just letting it pass through without paying any attention to it. The, the thing, the thing that I, the point I, I want to make here is that the Pasana meditation, the the Buddhist tradition from which mindfulness meditation was extracted, in its proper setting as part of a Buddhist spiritual path, it makes perfect sense because it's not the only thing you're doing. Those monks in you know in Sri Lanka in in Myanmar and so on, who are practicing this stuff night and day, they're not just doing mind mindfulness meditation. That's one part of their practice. They're also studying the Buddhist sutras. They're filling their mind as well as emptying it. They're doing all these various other exercises and so on, and that keeps them in balance. The problem is that for the la about the last 120 years or so, you've had people bringing these fragments of Eastern tradition into the Western world without the things that balance them. Back in the 60s and 70s, it was Zazen. Everyone was doing Zen meditation, and they were doing the kind of Zen meditation that involves emptying your mind. And it was functioning as a mental tranquilizer and, and sometimes a source of serious mental imbalance. I think many people got to know, you know meditation sickness, um, which is a known diagnosis in, in China and Japan. Um, and because Zen monks don't just do Zazen day and night, they also study the sutras. They also have these other exercises and practices and so on to keep them in balance. Mindfulness meditation, same trajectory. You pull one practice out of context and sell it all across America as a kind of cheap non-chemical tranquilizer for, you know, to keep you happy with your little corporate job. Um, very great for the corporations, which is why they, they market it so heavily, because they can get everyone just don't pay attention to the thoughts that are telling you that all that you're doing is, you know, feeding the machine and, and, and you're wasting your own life. Absolutely. But there are other ways to meditate. And the, the, the method that I, I originally learned um, within the Golden Dawn tradition and picked up and, and, you know, is that it used to be the classic Western way of meditation where you're not silencing your mind. You are using your mind in a focused, concentrated fashion. That becomes the focus of meditative awareness, your own thoughts. And so you take a theme, you develop it in, in mentally, you think, and you learn to think clearly. You learn to think in a balanced, exact way, and you go your own way. You understand things, and you learn how you best understand things. I, you know, I go on for pages about this, of course, but it's a very useful skill. It's an extraordinarily useful skill. Um, 150 years ago, it was being taught in most churches. Nowadays, it, nobody's heard of it. So it's one of the things that I do a lot of is picking up these these old things. And yeah, I'm kind of an intellectual dumpster diver. You know, I go into the dumpster and pull this out and say, wow, that's that. I can probably get that working again. And off it goes to the workshop to be hosed off and, and so on. 
that's a lot of what I do. And so this kind of meditation, discursive meditation, to give it its proper name, um, is one thing that I've really been trying to get back into circulation. Yeah, and it, it actually it reminded me a lot of I'm a huge fan of Alan Watts, and he talked about oh yeah 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 you know meditation. He doesn't like that word. Instead, he likes to use the word mm-hmm. contemplation because mm-hmm. it's more mm-hmm. of having a focus on what you are trying to sit with instead of sitting just to sit. And and. There, of course, is value yeah. of sitting with your own silence. I, I believe not a lot of people are willing to sit with themselves in silence because they're afraid of what is going to come up. But isn't that <laughs> the whole point? Oh, yeah. Is to sit with yourself yeah. and allow what needs to come up to actually come up, to actually connect mm-hmm. with your body mm-hmm. in such a way that it will communicate to you what it's been trying to communicate to you through physical diseases and why you are actually yeah. doing yeah, some yeah. of the things that you're doing. Exactly. Watts, Watts had the great advantage of having a very substantial background in Western as well as Eastern spirituality. I mean, many people, you will know about this, but many people don't know. Um, he was an Episcopalian priest for a while. And, you know, so he had the Eastern as well as the Western background. And so he was able to make, to make a lot of very useful comments. And, a lot, and, and right, I, I read a lot of his stuff back in the yeah, day. He, he's such a fascinating individual and also a perfect example mm-hmm. of, you know, he dealt with his own battles, even though people in modern days look back on his teachings and think he was just this grand enlightened being. But like all of us, we all have our shadow aspects and he had no problem owning that. Exactly. You can listen to a lot of his lectures yeah. that can be found and he talks about his mm-hmm. alcoholism and he talks about the ego and how he continues to go through mm-hmm. it. But the one thing that I always found that was unique, which again ties back to Druidry, he always said a lot of things Mm -hmm. with humor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. He was funny. He was not one of these stuffed shirts who, you know, who who, who never never cracked a joke. His humor was better than mine. (laughs) (laughs) He he definitely had a, a certain way about him, that is for sure. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I think this is a, a no. great point that I can ask you kind of our signature question here at Embrace and Expand. Mm-hmm. And so, John, what did you have to embrace in your life in order to expand into the person that you are today? Limitation. Mm-hmm. That's, you know, one of those things I once caused the, the effective temperature in a in a, the, this event that I was doing, they were asking similar questions and so on. And I mentioned that. And the temperature basically dropped 30 degrees in about 30 seconds. People did not like that. Limitation. Limitation is a bad rap these days. People say, well, you have to transcend all your limits. You have to pretend that you have no limits, constitute on being limitless. You're not thinking. Um, it, to, you, to use a technological metaphor, if you pour a bunch of gasoline on the ground and light it on fire, you have a fire. If you put that gasoline into um, a steel cylinder where it um, is um, set off so it can only expand, use its force to expand one way by pushing a piston, you go zooming down the road. Limitation is the basis of strength. It's the basis of achievement. It's the basis of getting anywhere. You have to accept the limits that you choose to accept and sometimes accept more limits than you would normally do in order, to, in order to achieve what you want. If you want to become a writer, I get asked this question a lot, you have to get rid of the things that keep you from becoming a writer. And there are some habits you'll need to change and some, um, some things in your life that you may have need to ditch because it's going to take you a lot of time. And you have to set aside other activities. You have to limit yourself so you can actually apply the seat of your pants to the seat of your chair and the tips of your fingers to the keypad and just keep typing. Um, limitation, you know, limitation is the basis of life. If you had no limits, well, you know, your chair is what's keeping you, what's limiting your capacity, your, your rump's capacity from bouncing off the floor. Your skeleton limits your capacity to collapse to the ground. Your skin, your immune system limits the ability of bacteria to move in and have, and, you know, munch up you, your, your tissues and so on. We exist because of limitation. And so the point is, which limits are you going to choose? Which are you going to accept? Which are you going to transcend? But you have to grasp the reality of limits. This is a druid thing. One of the things you learn about in dealing with nature is that human beings have to accept natural limits if we're going to live in harmony with nature. 
if we say, oh, I don't need that tree, it's it's in my way, I'm going to just get rid of that tree, I'm going to get rid of every tree down that way because I want to burn, you don't have any trees anymore. <laughs> and so an, a sense of an understanding of limits, a subtle and flexible recognition of how to live with limits and how to dance with limits, um, that was what it took for me to become a successful writer. That's what it took for me really to become a, a functional human being, to really grasp the need to acknowledge those limits. Of, those, those are my limits I can't change. To choose those limits that um, further my intention so that I can transcend the limits that I want to overcome. That is an answer that we have yet to receive here on the podcast. And I think is... <laughs> I bet it is. It's such a good one because... And I know I have fallen into the trap of trying to overcome certain limiting beliefs or trying to overcome certain things within myself. But as mm -hmm. I have continued to go down my path, and I like to refer to it as the journey back mm -hmm. itself, is mm -hmm. and why the Embrace and Expand podcast, our slogan is embrace everything that you are so you can expand into the best version of yourself. And that means to mm -hmm. embrace those limitations, accept them for what they mm -hmm. are and make the ter determining mm -hmm. factor of, okay, is this something that I can actually change? Yes or no? If the answer is no, then the only option is to just embrace that limitation fully and recognize that mm -hmm. that is an area where mm -hmm. maybe you need to ask for help. If you don't have the ability to speak in front of an audience, but you know somebody else that has the ability to do that, but you're a really good writer, well, now you just need to find somebody mm -hmm. to speak on your writings, and now you've created a great mm -hmm. team. Instead of sitting mm -hmm. back saying, well, I, I just am not a good speaker, so I'm just not going to share what it is that mm -hmm. I have to say, then that just is a disservice. Exactly. Or you can, you can find out that there's an organization called Toastmasters, which teaches the skills of speaking in public. And you go out and join your local Toastmasters club, and after a year of hard work, you can handle speaking in public. Yeah, again, you choose the limits you accept. You choose the limits you overcome. Among those, that you can change it all. Uh, I mean, we all have limits that we can't change. Um, I am going to die, so is everyone else who's listening, you know, everyone who's listening to this show. You know, none of us are immortal. That's a limit we can't change. We can ignore it. We can pretend it's not there, or we can accept it. We can do, um, I'll, I'll borrow a piece of visionary fiction, for, uh, a bit from a piece of visionary fiction from my youth, Carlos Castaneda, talking about how you know, the, the, the man of knowledge understands death. He, under, he embraces his death. He embraces the, the, the necessity and inevitability of death, and that is what makes it possible for him to live in the grand style, that's what, that, what, that is what allows him to accomplish things in the world because he treats every action as though it's his last battle on earth. Mm. Yeah, and, and his writings are also, um, for those of you that haven't read any of Carlos Castaneda's books, I would highly suggest yeah. them. They are very, very mm -hmm. informative, more so from, and I would actually, honestly, John, I would equate him equally to you. You know, you base your writings mm -hmm. off of Druidry, whereas he based his writings off mm -hmm. of um, South American shamanism. But fundamentally, mm -hmm. what you both are trying to say within those teachings are exactly the same, just, just like you've been talking about just now. There are some important similarities there. Now, part of that, of course, is that um, in my late teens and early 20s, I read every word I could get of Castaneda's stuff. I was, I, I was very deeply into um, his writing and studied very carefully. And I also later read some of the works that pointed out that some of what he was doing was fiction, that he was in fact a trickster. Mm -hmm. And he wove fact and fiction together in a very intricate way in his, in his writings. It doesn't matter. A thing does not have to be nonfiction to be, to be valid, to be as a spiritual guide. And so, you know, I, I, I have to give, I have to, you know, give acknowledgement where it's due. I learned a lot from Castaneda's books. Yeah, and, and, and that is kind of 
I, I mean, in a way, you have done similar things just from speaking on like the the mysteries of Merlin, for example, is, you know, some mm -hmm. of those teachings are myth. Y y you know, there there is no true oh, yeah. facts that we have to base, like, did Merlin even actually exist as a person? Or was he just a philosophy? Was he just... Was, is there, who was it? Celestius, the um, Roman um, philosopher from fairly late on, he used to say myths are things that never happened, but always are. Mm. And that's true of Castaneda's books. It's true of the stories of Merlin. It's true of a lot of these things. It doesn't have to be a matter of history to be a matter of, to, to express truth. Right. And so, you know, that's, that's one of the, one of the things that I think a lot of people need to get past the notion that if it didn't, happen you know if it didn't happen right there with you know with the news cameras rolling um or you know it it doesn't matter because in fact many i mean a lot of the things that have shaped the world very powerfully um in the, over the whole span of human history have been myths have been stories that that inspired people in various ways right. well and i think a lot of it brings comes back to just that having belief you don't need to actually, mm -hmm. and it, strangely enough, it makes me think of the movie, The Santa Claus, where the little kid asks his um, stepfather, who's a psychiatrist, he's like, well, you know, just because you don't see Santa doesn't mean he's real. Have you ever seen a million dollars? And, you know, his stepfather says no. And he's like, <laughs> well, just because you haven't seen it doesn't mean it isn't real. And that really mm -hmm. does kind of come down to a lot of these teachings like just mm -hmm. because there is no factual proof that king arthur or merlin existed doesn't mean that we still can't mm -hmm. believe in the code of the round table of to have honor mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. be just mm -hmm. to treat people as mm -hmm. equals instead of treating people as mm -hmm. higher or lower within a certain hierarchy yeah and that's the the arthurian legends are a great example because those have effect, those have had an immense impact on people's way of looking at the world for getting on for a thousand years now, and it changes in different ways. It, you know, each age kind of reinvents the Arthur that it needs, and so in a, some in some sense, Arthur is always you know he's the once and future king. He's always coming back, but he's always coming back in a different form and take, uh, different manifestations depending on what what what's needed at any given time, and so. Yeah. Um, was there actually a King Arthur? Well, there was probably a Roman general, um, a Roman British general who, from whose, whose family name was Artorius. That's a lot of historians agree that, that was, that's that's an easier explanation than any of the other ones. He probably had, you know, um, he probably had some cavalrymen who fought for him. That's as close as we get to the Round Table and and all that stuff. But but the Round Table is true, even though it's not factual. Yeah, it's valid even if it's inauthentic, historically speaking. And, and it's motivated a lot of people. Um, you, you see that with, with more recent things, Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. That's one that has shaped a lot of people's consciousness in some good ways and some not so good ways. The number of people who seem to, who, who, con who constantly try to see themselves as Frodo Baggins and see the other side in whatever quarrel might, they might be involved in as, as, you know, the Dark Lord Sauron. It's embarrassing, and it's, it has not helped American politics. But you know, every myth has its downside. Absolutely, and and you know, they all fundamentally just come down to another form of the hero's journey of putting yourself mm -hmm. in that sh in those shoes of trying to meet the adversity that rises within your journey, and how are you going to overcome that? How are you going to mm -hmm. keep that from beating you down and stopping you from continuing mm -hmm. on your quest? to finally mm -hmm. reach the end only to realize that there truly is no end to that quest. There's always just another quest, mm -hmm. one right after the other. Mm -hmm. A mythic figure that I think um, is worth cultivating right now, if I may, if I may suggest one, um, John Chapman, Johnny Appleseed. Mm -hmm. He was a historical person. He did many of the things that he was supposed to, he, he you know, does in legend, but he was, he was not one of these sort of hero's quests who is out there to fight something or conquer somebody. His mission was to spread apples, to make, um, to take this, this fruit, 
um, which was so very useful to pioneers and settlers, which was so very valued in that time. And he just spread them all over, you know, large parts of the United States. And he did it on his own, on foot, um, making a very sparse living, you know, sleeping, you know, when, when he when he happened to be in an area where there was a settlement, you know, if, if they had a piece of floor he could sleep on, he was fine. Otherwise, he'd just make, make himself a place to sleep in the woods. And he was he was a mythic figure. He was a profoundly mythic figure. And yet um, he was not looking for enemies. And I think one of the things we need right now is a recognition that we don't – maybe we're too busy looking at enemies. And maybe we're not busy enough looking at things we value that we can spread. And so just a suggestion. Oh, that's a beautiful suggestion and really – leads into the conversation of how it's important for each of us to cultivate what it means to live a life of fulfillment based upon our own terms mm -hmm. and not mm -hmm. like you were touching on earlier of trying to put ourselves mm -hmm. into a specific box and saying, well, if, if in order to be successful, I have to look like this or I have to live like this when, mm -hmm. you know, my wife and I, we, we just moved out of a, self-converted school bus that we've lived in for the last four years that mm -hmm. we've traveled all over the country in because we decided oh, sweet. we wanted mm -hmm. to live a life based on our own mm -hmm. values and how we wanted to see the world and what success meant to us and i've never been happier you know now we're we're back in a stick and brick house house again because we wanted to settle down roots and see if virginia was a place that we really wanted to call home but through doing that, it has made me realize that how little I actually need in order to truly be happy. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What a wonderful adventure. And I'm sure lots of people were saying, oh, you're crazy. How can you do? What a marvelous adventure to have. And, and yeah, the, the, thing, the thing, there's um, Joseph saint Peladon, who was a French occultist from the um, the very end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, used to say that society is an apparatus for living secondhand emotions. Mm -hmm. It's all about feeling other people, basically be handed emotions that you're, you're supposed to feel, rather than feeling for yourself. It's all about taking on identities that you're handed, rather than finding out who you are. And that was true in his time. It's true in our time. We've got the media. We've got the stores. We've got the whole corporate system trying to hand us emotions, hand us identities, get us doing things that benefit not you, not me, just the corporate system. Yeah. You, you do not benefit by buying 99.999% of the fetid crap that fills malls these days. You, the purchaser is the last person to benefit from that. The people who benefit from it are the multimillionaires in the corner, corner offices. If you get rid of that stuff, if you ignore it, if you walk away, climb in your school, school bus and drive off into the woods, if that's what works for you, um, then you can actually have a life. And I think a lot of people are realizing that. They've been screaming in the, in the financial press recently, uh, before they started screaming about bank failures, as, as, as it's now going on. Um, they were screaming about the, the, the labor problem. Where are all these workers? Where, where are all these people who should be stocking our you know, miserable um, minimum wage um, jobs? Where are the people who should be doing this? And People are not – they must be lazy. No, they're not lazy. I know many of these people who, during the shutdown, they looked at their lives and they looked at the, the horrible treatment they were getting from the corporate system, from their bosses and their jobs and things like that, and said, you know, it's not worth it. They had the chance to sit with their own silence there and actually listen to themselves and go, it's not, that life is not worth living. And so they walked away. Yeah. And they're still walking away. And more and more people are recognizing that the corporate system, the sort of um, good life that we're all that's pushed at us constantly through the media and everything like that, is crap. It's a miserable excuse for an existence, and you don't have to do it. There are other ways to live. You can follow your own heart. You can follow your own dreams. You can, you know, climb aboard a school bus and drive away, or just start walking. Or just quit and find something else to do with your time. 
There's lots of ways. And I think a lot of people are grasping that now. A lot of people are realizing that they don't have to take what's being pushed. Yeah. And that's honestly, that's one of the big things that I do as a coach is work with people Mm -hmm. on trying to help them figure out what it is that they can do based off of what it is that they want to do. And I think that's a question that a Mm -hmm. lot of people don't really ask themselves is they look at, I have to work this job because I need to make this money because I need to pay all of these bills so that I can have all of these things and live this certain life. But if you actually Mm -hmm. stopped and ask yourself the question, is that what you really want? (laughs) Yeah, that's when life gets interesting. And people, yeah. and, and a yeah. lot of times when I present people with that question, they sit there speechless for a second because they realize mm-hmm. how long they've lived their life without actually asking that question of, is this actually mm-hmm. what I want? Mm-hmm. And a lot of the work that I do is inevitably taking people back to their childhood to figure out what, what did you mm-hmm. like to do as a child? What did you like to do that mm-hmm. brought you a tremendous amount of joy? And once we can figure out what that is, Mm -hmm. that's the direction that most people inevitably Mm -hmm. end up going. Well, it certainly worked for me. I liked writing. I I enjoyed um, writing stories from the time I was about old enough to to hold onto a crayon. And so I I made a beeline for a writer's career. It took me a long time to actually break into print and so on, but I did it. And and it, it works very well for me. And I think, I think for a lot of people, it is very much a matter of finding the thing that actually works for you, finding the things you want to do. And yeah, you may have to be poor for a while. Yeah. And, that, of course, a lot of people are terrified of that, but it's not that big a deal. Once you learn how to be poor, you, you find, you'll find out you can do it with perfect grace. It's not that hard. You can be comfortable and poor. You can be well-fed and poor. You can, you can be free and poor. And then once you've got that baseline, you can build on that and end up having, you know, if you, if you really want money, you can earn it. It can be had. Right. And you can go for right. it. I took a trip down to um, just outside of Cusco, Peru in 2018 and met a mm-hmm. lot of really mm-hmm. beautiful people who by Western standards were totally impoverished, didn't have a lot to their name, but were the happiest people that I have ever met. Because Mm -hmm. all their basic Mm -hmm. needs were fulfilled. They had community. They had people that they loved around them. They always had family over for dinner. And to to be able to see that really hammered home. And that was at the very beginning of my wife and I moving into our bus. And I was going through somewhat of an existential crisis of having to sell Mm -hmm. all of my materialistic things, sell my home, sell my cars. And questioning myself am i doing the right thing and is this really what i should be doing does is it this even what i want and through having those experiences while i was in peru i was able to come back and then drive around in my bus with a whole new sense of appreciation for life and a whole new sense of gratitude Mm -hmm. for Mm -hmm. everything that i Mm -hmm. possibly need is within the confines of this steel tube my family my animals (laughs) all of our food, Mm -hmm. a way to keep us warm Mm -hmm. with our wood stove, like all of the needs that we possibly could have was there. And what more do you Mm -hmm. actually need Mm -hmm. from that aside from continuing to just live life and continuing to experience life to the fullest that it can offer you? Mm -hmm. I really think that it it is a benefit to people to, you know, it certainly was a benefit to me coming from a middle-class background where I, I never had to worry about um, you know, where my next meal was coming from. There's all this consumer, consumer crap all over the place. To actually be poor for a while, um, to actually you know, be working as, as I did before I got into print. I was working you know, minimum wage jobs as, you know, as, as few hours as I could manage and still pay, still pay my share of our bills. And, but just not have much money because it really pushes you back on your own resources. It teaches you the difference between what you want and what you need. And it teaches the difference between what you want and what you've been taught you want, you ought to want. And so it's, it's, you know, I think a lot of people who, um, you know, they go from high school directly into college, they go directly from college into a job, they're caught up in the whole um, consumer economy before they quite manage to figure out, before they even start figuring out who they are. 
and they miss the chance to actually take a break and um, deal with, you know, who am I and what, what do I want out of life? So because I wanted to be a writer, I was kind of constrained to have that experience because, you know, you don't – very, very few people go through the J.K. Rowling kind of experience where their first novel is snapped up and becomes a multibillion-dollar bestseller. My, my, my first book, uh, I, got, I got some money for it <laughs> and, and so on. It's been a long, slow ride, and it usually is for most writers. And so learning to um, – I, I assumed that going in, it turned out to be the case – um, for most writers, that's what you experience. It was good for me. I've had, I've known other people who had similar experiences, and I think there's a lot to be said for what what Thoreau, Thoreau used to call voluntary poverty, actually accepting a deliberate descent into a, a materially impoverished lifestyle, so you can actually unpack your non-material wealth. Mm. Yeah, and really, really get to discern what actually is truly meaningful to you. Mm-hmm. And, exactly. and that meaning can go beyond the physical. Oh, yeah. It, it normally does. <laughs> yeah, it's, it. you know, I've always had people pose me the question of, you know, they ask you, are, are you religious? And I've always kind of said, well, I'm spiritual, but not religious. And over the years, I've adopted the saying mm-hmm. of, well, love is my religion and nature is my church. Okay, cool. And that's how I feel Druidry very much is all about mm-hmm. because it is about mm-hmm. having nature be your church, having nature be about it's the place that you worship. It's it's the things that bring us life. If there were no trees, we mm-hmm. realistically wouldn't be able to be here because we wouldn't be able to breathe. Exactly. If there, if there, were, if there, were, there were no plants, there would be no oxygen and we would be stone cold dead in, in a fairly short order. Um, but the, the thing to keep in mind, of course, is that na- there's no place outside of nature. There's this, there's this superstition in modern industrial society that human beings are somehow separate from nature. We're not. We're natural beings. We're, li- we're living animals, for heaven's sake. Our bodies are natural things. Um, inside our houses, um, air still, still circulates according to the laws of physics, objects that are let go of drop. These are all laws of nature. Um, we are all part of the natural world. We're all part of the divine as it expresses itself through nature. You cannot get back to nature because you never could leave mm. you never went away we just like 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 children who put their hands over their eyes and say i can't see you that was our attitude toward nature for a while and it really didn't work that well right i suspect the trees were chuckling at us going mm, come on kid <laughs> but you know so maybe we should take our hands off our eyes recognize that nature is all around us all the time anyway and start learning how to live in the in in the real world of nature, rather than in this imaginary world of, of you know, abstract human this that and the right. other. Yeah, yeah. It, that's one druid idea. It makes me think of I I did a podcast episode seven where I talk about um, falling out of a tree and having a transcendental experience because of it. Mm-hmm. And one of the mm-hmm. aha, mm-hmm. I was trying to cut some branches out of a tree to clear sight for our satellite internet and. Um, ended up falling mm-hmm. 15 feet off the top of the ladder and hitting my head on the root of the next tree over. Ooh. And Ooh. one of the things that came to me that night through the transcendental experience that I had was that part of the lesson that I needed to learn is I didn't ask the tree for permission. Uh, yeah. And it made me realize that there truly is consciousness and awareness in everything that is around us, even mm-hmm. if we aren't willing to see it, mm-hmm. even if we can't tangibly feel mm-hmm. it, sense it, hear it, it's still there. Mm-hmm. And so by oh, yeah. me just yeah. blindly going through and just cutting branches on these trees that have probably been here longer than I've been alive, it made me realize that how much of that have I done throughout my life without actually asking permission from nature, is this okay? Can I actually do this? Can I take your resource and use it to my advantage? And that one instance has really shifted how I walk through the world and how I even walk through these woods here to be more cautious of where I place my footstep, to not crush a plant, to recognize that that plant has every 
bit of meaning as what I do walking through the woods, that it has something to be able to offer to the world, even if it's just the beauty of the flower that it produces. So if people listening to this are like, I really like everything that you have to say, but out of your 70 books, where do I start? <laughs> okay. If you're interested, it depends on where, on what interests this, the, the listeners in question. Anyone who's interested in Druidry, the book of mine that you mentioned, the, the Path of mm -hmm. Druidry, uh, the Druid Path, maybe I'm... I have enough at this point. I have to sort of stop and scratch my head and say, now, what was the name of that one? The Druid Path. Um, that would be a really good introduction. That's what it's there for. It's meant to be a basic introduction to Druidry for, for anybody who's interested. It includes practices as well as the history and philosophy. And that, so that would be a good sort of introductory place to go. Um, if you're interested in looking at some, some of the, the stuff that I've been talking about a little on um, society and um, what are some of the problems we're facing. Actually, the book there would be one called Green Wizardry, which talks about our relationship with nature and how what some of the useful paths, the useful things, ways we might go about changing it. Um, other than that, um, ecosophia.net, I post something every Wednesday. It's usually something fairly strange, and it's always long. I am the master of deal there posts. And, but, you know, that's, I, I always have stuff coming up there, and it's, some, it's one place to pay attention to if you're interested, what kind of things I'm, I'm thinking about what I'm writing about these days. Fantastic. So if you could leave our listeners with one last piece of advice before we call it an episode, what would you mm -hmm. offer them? Um, the advice that I would have is to stop and think. There's, we have all of this just do it slogans. We all of this, you know, um, don't bother to stop. Don't bother to think. Must be in a rush. Must go running out and do this and this and this because it will have all this benefit to the corporate system. Stop. Sit down. Take your time. Do some thinking. Look at yourself squarely and say, is this really what I want? Is this really who I am? Is this really the path I want to go? We, the, right now, we're, we're probably, the, the, the U.S. is probably teetering on the edge of a fairly large economic crisis. The 18th largest bank in the, in the country just went bankrupt. And um, there's, there's more, apparently more on the way. So we're likely to see a lot of crisis, a lot of yelling, a lot of panic, a lot of hand-waving. And we've got to do this. We've got to stop. At your breath, think. That's crucial right now. That's my piece of advice. It's fantastic advice. Fantastic advice. Always best to just take a pause and listen to what your body has to tell you for sure. Well, John, thank you so much for your time and coming onto the podcast, sharing with us your wisdom. Um, your writings have definitely caused many a questions to come up for me and many things to contemplate on, on what I can do better, how I can live better within this world and the very nature that we're a part of. I'm glad to hear it. And thank you very much for having me on. Appreciate it. So thank you all for listening to the podcast. Always enjoy having you here and we'll catch you on the next one.